hallelujah in this place. Lord, we just thank you. We praise you. We love you. Lord, we just want to give you honor. But Father God, while we're in your presence, we need your deliverance. We need the healing. Lord, we need your peace in this place. So Lord, we're just asking just to bask in your presence, Lord. Hallelujah. Nothing in this world can satisfy. Jesus, you're the cup that won't run dry. Your presence is heaven to me. Your Redeemer of my past and presence wrong. Holder of my future days to come. Your presence is heaven to me. Nothing in this world can satisfy. Jesus, you're the cup that won't run dry.
Good morning and welcome to Impact Community Church. Uh, we thank you for tuning in this morning. Uh, if you don't mind, we'll have a quick word of prayer before we go into God's word. Father, we thank you for being here today, O oh God. We thank you for what you have done in our lives today. We thank you for waking us up today, O oh Lord. And we just count it a blessing to be uh, part of the body of Christ today, O oh Lord. We ask that as we go into your word this morning, that you would give us fresh revelation, fresh insight today, O oh God. And we just thank you today that as a seed goes forth, that it will multiply a hundredfold today, O oh Lord. And we just thank you today for all those who are tuning in. We ask that you would bless us exceedingly abundantly today, O oh God. And we just thank you today that every need is met today, O oh Lord, and we thank you today for it all. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So if you have your Bibles this morning, uh, I want you to turn with me to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12, uh, we'll read verses 1 through 5. Uh, if you have your Bibles or your tablet, uh, your phone, grab, uh, grab it and go to Exodus chapter 12. And the Bible says this in Exodus 12 verse 1, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. Verse 4 says, And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Verse 5 says, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And so uh, this morning I, I want to talk about reset. And so uh, there are a lot of things going on in our land, uh, but I believe through it all, God wants to give us not just a reset, but a spiritual reset. And so if you know anything about scripture, Exodus chapter 12 is actually the story of the deliverance of the children of Israel. And so uh, Exodus 12 actually give, uh, gives us the story of the night before the children of Israel were released from Egyptian oppression. Uh, and it was the night that they were released from being slaves. And so what we understand from the story is that before their deliverance, there was a back and forth between uh, Pharaoh and Moses and the children of Israel and the Egyptians. And if you remember also, it took 10 plagues to release God's people, to actually set them free uh, so that they could do what God had been calling them to do from day one. And so, but how many know that one thing that we need to be aware of is uh, uh, releasing or being released won't come easy. Sometimes there's some things that we have to go through in order for God to set us free. Uh, when I begin to think about where the world is today, uh, we have been sheltering in place uh, as a society. And when I think about what was going on in Exodus chapter 12, they actually were sheltering in place to a certain degree as well, because God had told them to stay at home until the morning, until the day that he was going to set them free. And so, and I just want to spend some time just highlighting some of the things in their society at large and see if we can make some comparisons to our society today. Uh, and hopefully if I do a good job, you'll begin to see some of the things that were going on there uh, with some of the things that are going on today. And you'll also begin to see the spiritual need that God uh, has to give us in order for us to go uh, to the next level. And so after all, uh, one of the things that, that I love about God is after everything is said and done, he always has the last word. And so uh, just a couple of things that I want to, to talk just real briefly uh, is that the children of Israel and Egypt, they were divided in how they approached life. And so Pharaoh and the Egyptians thought that life should go one way, 
And Moses and the children of Israel believed that life should go another way. And so not only were they divided in how they approached life, but they were diametrically opposed in their views about life. And so and this actually becomes just a visual picture of the haves and have-nots. And so when I begin to think about society today, you have ruling classes, you have middle class, you have lower class, and we all have a definition of what it means to succeed. And so there was a division between the ruling class and the commoners in the world. Uh, one group desired to be free, and the other group desired that things remain the same. So if it hasn't started looking like what you've seen lately, then just hang on while I continue to paint on this canvas, right? So you had the well-to-dos and the not-so-well-to-dos. You had a ruling class and a subservient class. You had the rich and the poor, and they were living in pretty much the same territory. And so everybody had dreams of success, but only a certain group had the manifestation of their, of their dreams. And so how many know that it's difficult to remain in the same territory with people who are doing better than you when you believe in your heart they are the reason why you are not succeeding? And so and I think we all understand a little bit about what I'm talking about. And so when I think about the state of our world, when I think about everything that's going on in America specifically, I think we have become very tribalistic in nature. Everyone has become tribalistic in their views of life. Everything is slanted toward our selfish desires and not necessarily the good of the whole. And so we see things only from one perspective. And we do not want to see, nor do we have the courage to see, things from another person's perspective. And so we live in a world where we're inundated with news feeds 24 hours a day. And so cable news networks reinforce an agenda without hearing the other side. And so your particular news station will never give you another point of view. And you know what? And I think when you continue to look at that particular news station to the extent that you don't hear anything else, I think your mind gets jaded. I, I think one of the things that, that, that uh, would help us is that we begin to listen to other people's point of view. You don't know everything, and I don't know everything. And sometimes God gives us time where we're able to listen to other people's points of view. And but when I was talking about listening to the news channels, those are the things that come on 24 hours a day. And what we do is we feed ourselves with that to the extent that we don't hear anything else. And so I think that we have become so tribal until, notice this, everyone wants to be around people who look like them, who act like them, and who think like them. And so we all have a tendency to feel comfortable in the fellowship with people who look like us, who believe like us, and to act like us. And so we are closest to people who share our interests, our lifestyle, and our habit. And so truly the, the phrase, birds of a feather, flock together with a lot of people who live in our country. And it's just not our country, it's, it's people who live around the world. And so this applies to a lot of people. And and so we have financial tribalism, we have cultural tribalism, emotional tribalism, we have educational tribalism, and obviously we have racial tribalism. And so when you look at that, and you also know that we have political tribalism, and so in fact, political tribalism is so rampant until our government officials would rather allow the government to shut down than to see somebody else's perspective. And so when you begin to think about the shutdown of 2019, which was the longest in American history, it was because two sides who fought for what they wanted, couldn't come to an agreement for the sake of the country. And so we have become a nation that cast our vote based on one issue. And so we vote based solely on our self-interest. And so whether it's abortion, the definition of marriage, the definition of the family, Second Amendment rights, or the verbiage regarding Social Security reform and other entitlement pro programs, that's how we vote. And so we live in a nation where God is wanting us to love one another. He's wanting us to respect one another. He's wanting us to hear one another. But we also live in a country of the have and have not. And so we live in a country where people are doing well, and then you also live in a country, the same territory, where people aren't doing so well. And so you have those who uh, are, are very well off uh, financially, and then you have those who are not well off financially. And notice this, we're all living in the same 
area. When I think about Exodus chapter 12, the children of Israel who were slaves, they had been slaves for 400 years. They had been under the dictates and the rulership of Pharaoh, and they began to see what God was doing over there and what God was doing in their life, and they began to realize that it was not right. And so even though there are dire consequences for the masses, sometimes we still stick to our tribe at all costs, so much so that uh, our party vote really may not line up with our personal beliefs, but we still vote that way Anyway, and so we vote based on a candidate's promise about the future instead of voting based on what they have done for us right now. And so I don't need to hear what you're going to do in the future if you haven't done anything about my today. And so we have turned into a tribal group of Americans who all confess Christ, but we live out Christ much differently. And so poor people live out Christianity much differently than well-to-do Christians. And so that's just a fact. And so I just want to give you something to think about. He wants to reset all of us. And so he wants to reset the poor. He wants to reset the mind of the, of the rich. He wants to reset the mind of females. He wants to reset the mind of males. He wants us all to have a reset. And so sometimes the intense loyalty to our tribe is even contrary to common sense. There are some things that have been enacted. There are some views that we have that goes even against common sense. And so how many know you don't have to be a PhD in order to do what's right. You don't have, a, have to have a master's in social work to understand what's right. You don't even have to be literate to know what's right. And so if education makes you hate your brother, then I would say your education is overrated. And so if financial success makes you despise those who are less fortunate in that they have, that you think they want a hand out instead of a hand up, then I think it's overrated. And so when your tribalism goes beyond common sense, facts, or personal values, we need a spiritual reset. And that's what we are here talking about this morning. How many know this? The coronavirus doesn't care about a tribe, doesn't care about your income, doesn't care about your political affiliation. And so it did not care if you were liberal or conservative, an atheist, a religious, uh, or religious, or a pacifist, or a gun owner. It did not care. And so when the coronavirus hit our country, it did not care. It didn't care if you voted red or blue. It didn't care if you supported Black Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter, or if you believe that all lives matter. And so the coronavirus didn't differentiate between the 99 percentiles or the 1 percentiles. And so the coronavirus banished us all to our house. And in Exodus chapter 12, what was going on that night banished everyone to their house. And God called it that way. He ordained it that way because he was getting ready to show everybody something. I believe that even in the, the time that we're living in right now, everybody has been in their home. I believe God is showing us something. And in the end, I think he wants you to get a reset. And so there are some things that he wants to reset in you. And we're going to talk about that uh, in a minute. And so in Exodus chapter 12, the Bible says this, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. And it says, Speak unto the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers and a lamb according to their house. And so because God had told everybody to stay at home because the death angel was passing through. And so he told them to stay home for safety re reasons. And so that should begin to sound a little bit familiar to you, that we are all at home because of safety reasons. And so he said that God had told them that there was going to be something coming into the land that could possibly kill them. And in order to stay safe, just like us, they had to stay home. And so you did not, you didn't tune in this morning by accident. I believe it was God ordained that you hear exactly what the Lord is speaking uh, this morning. And so so with everything that's going on, I'm going to say it again, God wants to have a reset in your life, and not only a reset, but a spiritual reset. And so God wants to start some things over again in our life. And so how many know that when we come out of shelter at home, it's going to be a new day for us? And so God is looking for us to do better things when we come out 
than when, what we were doing when we went in. And so Exodus chapter 12, verse 2, the Bible says, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. This is going to be the first day of the rest of their lives. And so Exodus chapter 12, verse 2, the end part, it says, it shall be the first month of the year to you. And so this was going to be a new calendar for them. It was going to be a new birthing for them. And so they had been in bondage and slavery for over 400 years. And to make matters worse, tonight they were all cooped up in their house. And so not a creature was stirring, nobody was moving. God had told them to go in the house for their own safety, and that's where they were. And so then God begins to tell Moses to tell them, tomorrow I'm going to give you a new day. And so how many know that God wants to give us a new day as well? And so it's a blessing to be able to start over. It's a blessing to be able to have God push the reset button for us. And so they went into the house in bondage, but they were getting ready to come out free. And so they were free to do what God had been calling them to do through all of the 10 plagues. And so they had prayed for deliverance from their captives, and now the day had come when God was actually going to give them freedom. But it was going to come through a reset. And so he was going to give them an opportunity to do things differently. And so we have been in our homes for several weeks now, and just like them, some of us have been begging God to let us get back out. Let us get back into society. Let us be able to do some of the things and go to some of the places that we haven't been able to do and haven't been able to go to. And God is saying, I'm going to allow it, but I want you to be different when you go out. And so we've been asking God to please let me out. I'm tired of eating hamburger helper, so to speak. And so I don't want to do that just for one more night. And so God is getting ready to allow people to come out. But as a Christian, he's going to expect greater things from you when you come out than when you went in. And so the day is soon approaching where we'll we'll all be released. And so the question is, are you going to be different when God allows you to come out? And so how will you allow God to reset you? With the release comes a reset. With the freedom comes the resetting. And so God has hopefully put something on the inside of you so that when you come out, you're going to be different. And that's the spiritual reset that I'm talking about. And so there's going to be a new normal for us. And so God says that if you only want to be around people who look like you and who act like you, then he said, you know what, then you might as well continue to stay in your house. He said, that's what you had when you were in shelter in place. And so they act like you, and then sometimes they begin to look like you, and they have the same philosophy as you. And God is saying, what are you learning? And more importantly, what are you contributing to the world? And so they were in a home, and so they had experienced a a lot of bad things up until that point, and now it was going to be one night, and God was going to release them. And so after shelter at home, God's going to release you. And so this message actually uh, is prophetic in nature because there, there are doors that are getting ready to open. And so governors are getting ready to lift the bands and mayors are getting ready to say, you know what, you can go back and do some of the things that you were doing. But how many know God is wanting to reset you? And so the world may continue doing what they were doing, but God is looking for greater things from you. And so Americans have been asked to social distance. We have now distanced ourselves from people in the same fashion that we have distanced ourselves from God. And so we have distanced ourselves from God by staying at home when we had the opportunity to do things that God was telling us to do before the coronavirus came. And so we have distanced ourselves by living in our own little world. And so some people have social distanced themselves from God for years. We have practiced spiritual social distance. And so we have found that that social distance actually brings isolation. Well, how many know when you practice spiritual social distance, you're actually isolating yourself from God, who is the only person that can help you? So man or things are not adequate to fill the space that only God can fill. And so some look to their spouse, some look to their possessions, but only God is able to fill us. And so when we are isolated, God wants us to turn to Him, not to somebody else. And so if it's, if it's your goal to be spiritually healthy, then you cannot social distance yourself 
from God. We have found that in today's society, social distancing is good, but notice this, it does not disinfect you. Social distancing does not kill the germs that would want to come and attach itself to us. And by social distancing ourselves from God, the spiritual social distancing, it does not allow God to clean us up. And so spiritually speaking, if you want to be clean, you'll have to come in his presence. And so we have distanced ourselves because of hurt, because of busyness. We have distanced ourselves because of our work schedule. We have spiritually distanced ourselves because of a new definition of spirituality, which in a lot of cases means I don't even have to come to church. I can just worship a higher power. And so we have cheated ourselves of the experience with God. And so the Bible says, if you'll seek me, you'll find me. In fact, the scripture says, seek me while I may be found. And so if you want to reset with God, he is available. His arms are open wide for you. And so spiritual social distancing can only be remedied by a spiritual washing. And when I said earlier that social distancing does not kill germs, You still have to go home and wash your hands. You still have to use your wipes. You still have to use uh, your, your sanitizer. And so how many know that if you want to be clean spiritually, you're going to have to let God wash you. And so you can't stay separated from him and still be clean. David said that he wanted God to wash him. And so how many know this, that That spiritual social distancing can only be remedied by spiritual washing. And there is a spiritual pandemic that's affecting a lot of people. What are you talking about, Pastor Randy? That Christians don't pray. Christians don't honor God. Christians don't serve. Because how many know if you're not in a church, then you're not serving the way God would want you to serve. And you say, well, you know what? I serve in other ways. But God would still want you to be yoked up, hooked up to a body where you're actually able to serve other believers, brothers and sisters, and unbelievers. And so you can barely get some Christians to actually go to church. This is the reset. This is part of the reset. And so some of us have downgraded God just to background noise. And so you may stream in, but you're not really there. And so God is in the background when he should be in the forefront. And so you cannot beat coming to church. There's always going to be a release. There's always going to be a reset. There's always going to be an opportunity for you to get closer to God when you come to his house. And so it's just not millennials who are not coming because millennials were raised by people who did not come. And so millennials don't come because they weren't taught the value of coming to church. In some cases, they weren't taught the value of reverencing God. And so when we look at a generation of younger people, when we look at a generation of older older people, there needs to be a reset in all generations. And so, you know, right now we don't have soccer practices. We don't have basketball practice. We don't have volleyball practice. There are no dance recitals. There are no plays at the Civic Center. The movie theaters are closed. And in a few weeks, they're all going to be open again. The only thing that will be new is you. God wants to spiritually reset you. And so we, we, we post God talk on our pages, but we don't go to church. We have good sayings about being blessed, but you don't know the blesser. You think that going to church on Easter gives you a pass for another year. It doesn't give you a pass for another year. And so churches now have 70-minute sermons. They have a relaxed dress code, and you still can't find your way to church. You need to have a reset. And so some people say, well, people ain't right in the church. And so they're just a bunch of hypocrites. Well, how many know that everybody in the gym is not the weight that they need to be? And how many know you can still have people in the medical profession that will give you good advice that they don't even take? And so Psalms chapter 51, the Bible says, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. This is David talking. In verse 6 of Psalms 51, it says, behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Verse 7, David said, purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. And finally, in verse 8, he says, make me to hear joy and gladness. And so David had a point in his life where he hit a low spot. And God sent the prophet to come and help reset his life. 
And so once he was confronted with the fact that he could be doing better, that he had heard from God and didn't follow God, David said, you know what, God, I want you to wash me. I want you to wash me from all my iniquity, and I want you to cleanse me from my sin. He was saying, I want to reset God. And so behold, he said, verse 6, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. God is looking not just at what you uh, portray to other people on the outside, but he's looking at the real you. The real reset in your life is going to come from a reset on the inside. And so David wrote this when Nathan the prophet came to him to tell him, man, you had sinned. And so this morning, I'm telling you that, you know what, God wants a little bit more out of you. And so he doesn't want the status quo. And so I don't know what your life was like before coronavirus hit and before the shelter in place order went forth. But I do know this, God is saying he wants to reset you. In fact, there are things that you've been going through uh, within, within the past four weeks or five weeks or six weeks that's going to make you a better person. I've talked to a lot of people and I've talked to a lot of husbands and they're saying that they have been, they've been able to spend more time with their kids. They've been able to spend more time with their wives. They've increased their prayer time. They've increased their devotional time. All all of the things that they were asking God to help them with before coronavirus came. Because I think a lot of us were praying, God, help me. I want to give you more time. I want to get up early in the morning and pray and seek your face. And for whatever reason, we hadn't been able to do it. And now we're sheltering at home and we're actually having the opportunity to do the things that we've been wanting to do all along. God is saying, I've reset you and don't you forget it. Don't let it go. And so you know when you have a problem on your phone or, your, or on your computer, one of the first things you try to do is to go back. I can't tell you that how many times that when you click a site and, and sometimes things freezes, they freeze on your computer, the easiest thing to do is to go back. And you know you really have a problem that when you go to a site or you go to a, a, a web address and it locks up your computer and you can't go back. There are some things about life that you can't go back. And so when my computer locks up or my phone locks up and I hit the back button and I hit the forward button and I can't go either way, we have to do what's known as a reboot. And so a reboot, uh, I remember when I was going to school years ago and computers had first uh, come out. And so if I was typing a paper uh, and, and maybe I uh, unplugged the cord or my battery was low and the computer was shut off or maybe I was working and lightning had hit it and it had a surge and it automatically reboot. Back in the day, it didn't save anything. And so we're fortunate now that computers, that when something happens, it automatically saves. But back in the day, it didn't save anything. And some of y'all know exactly what I'm talking about. And so, but when you have a reset, it begins to generate itself God begins to pour into you the things that he wants you to have and some things he wants you to let go. There are some things that he wants you to say bye-bye to. And so there are the, the reset that's coming in your life is actually going to be you stepping forward and letting go of some old mindsets, letting go of some old philosophies. And so how many know we can't go backwards? And it's difficult to go forward right now with shelter in place, but how many know that the day is coming when we're going to be able to go back out. And so when we go back out, we have to go back out with purpose. And so years ago, I'm going to say this, when, when we were working on uh, computers, and a lot of us, we didn't know too much about it, and, and we were just typing and, and, and didn't save things the way that we needed to have saved them. And when things would happen, we would, uh, and, we, and we found out that we had lost uh, whatever we were working on, whatever that document was, I mean, it sent you into a, a tailspin. And so because, uh, and, and I'm just like you, I tried several ways to get it back and it was gone. And so there might be times as we go forward that you're trying to get things that have gone in the past. And know this, that if you can't get to it, it must mean that God didn't want you to have it. Amen. Could it be that our nation was frozen for a reason? Could it be that our nation had clicked on so many different sites and we didn't realize what the sites were actually releasing into our spirits? And so sometimes you can click on sites and they're full of viruses. As a nation, I think we had clicked on a lot of sites and it began to release 
a virus to the point that mankind couldn't even get along with mankind. That they didn't judge you based on what you were doing. They judged you whether or not you were blue or red. And God is saying, we've got to have a reset. We have to have a reboot. And so he has given us time for a reboot. He wants to reset us. And so he wants to reboot us. And so he wants us not to save some things that caused us to lock up. And he wants us to release some things so that we can continue going forward. And so the question is, are you going to advance with all the sites that clogged you up in the beginning, or are you going to let them go? And so my question is, how are you going to be when you have the opportunity to go forward? Because that day is soon and vastly approaching. And so to all my millennials who live in your own world, you think the only thing that's going on is what's going on in your life. I apologize if that's what you've been taught, but you're missing out on your assignment that God has for you. And so to all the baby boomers who are trying to live life to the fullest now because you didn't get a chance to live life when you were 20 and 30 and 40, and so now you're looking at this as being an opportunity for you to go out and live your life. God is saying, I want to reset that mindset. And so there's still more that God wants you to do. And so there are things that he wants to continue to pour into you before you're actually Release. How many know that resets make you better? But you have to accept the fact that you're going to lose some stuff. And I think we are paranoid and we are scared and we are fearful of losing things. One of the things that I have learned regarding God and my walk with Him is that if I lost some things along the way, it's only going to make me better. And He knew that I didn't need it. And so sometimes we're trying to hold on to things that are weighing us down. And so many of us have allowed the enemy to hack the account of our heart, and he sends out emails that look like they come from us, and you know what? It has our name attached, but it's not really us, because there's something that, that he has sent out portraying us, and there are some things that we bought into that's really not our heart. And so just because you belong to a certain party doesn't mean that you give up all your common sense. And so some of the things that we portray, God is saying on the, on the inside of you that you're different. He said, I made you differently. And so we have become so submerged in the world's definition of living until we have adopted and adapted it as our own. And although I don't know why the virus came, there'll be a lot of people to tell you why the virus came. I can't tell you why the virus came. I can tell you this. That while we've been at home for four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, whatever the case may be, God had the ability to make you better. He had the ability to reset you. He has the ability to reset our nation. And so although we don't know why, we do have to understand that God knows why, and he allowed it to happen, and he wants us to be better now than we were when we went in. And so God has given us time to reset. And so in Exodus chapter 2, I'm going to get into some things. Uh, there are two primary events that I want to discuss with you this morning, and these are significant and actually going to help you with your spiritual reset. And so the first thing in Exodus is Jesus. You cannot have a reset without Christ. The Bible says this in verse 6 of Exodus chapter 12. It says, And you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And it's talking about the sacrificial Passover lamb. So it says, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month, talking about the lamb, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Verse 7, it says, and they shall take of the blood and strike it upon the two sides of the doorpost and on the upper doorpost at the, of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And so the Bible says this in verse 13, it says, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon your houses. And it says, when you, where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And so God says, if you put the door, the blood on the doorpost, he says, I'll pass over. And so first of all, you've got to have the blood right? The blood comes from the lamb, which is typified in the New Testament as Christ Jesus, typified in the Old Testament as Christ Jesus. And once that blood was shed, they were supposed to put the blood over the doorpost. And God says, when I see the blood, I'll pass over, right? And so God has protected us. He has kept us. Putting the blood on the top of the frame and down the side of the door frames just gave indication that God's people were residing in the house, 
And so the blood served as a plague stopper. And so the plague could only go as far as God allowed it. And the blood stopped the plague. That's what you have to understand. And so the blood of Jesus served as a protective shield for them from the outside diseases that were lurking in the dark and places that they could not even see. A lot of us, we have pled the blood, right? That could because there were things that we could not see that were lurking in the dark. And so some of us anointed our houses, and we anointed our door frames. And so, and and y'all are looking at me like, "Mm." no, some of us, we did that as a a sign that, God, you are protecting this house. And so the Lord is our protector. The Bible says in Psalms 27, verse 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Psalms 23, verse 1 says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. In Psalms 91, verse 1, it says, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He's my refuge, my fortress. And so He is our protector. Protection comes through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we know what the Word of God says, and we are quick to apply the blood. And as a Christian, you ought to be quick to apply the blood. And so you can't can't beat people saying, I plead the blood. I speak the blood. And they begin to apply the blood to the doorpost of their life. However, if you continue reading the Scripture, God required that they not only apply the blood to the doorpost, but He also required that they eat the lamb. And that's something that sometimes we don't talk a lot about. But in Exodus chapter 12, verse 6, the Bible says, And you shall keep it until the fourteenth day, of the month when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. And verse 7, it says, put the blood on the doorpost. But verse 8, it says, and they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. How many know we do a good job of covering our doorposts? We all make outward confessions of Jesus. You can't beat us talking about Jesus and the blood of Jesus. We confess the blood, but we don't eat the lamb. And so they go together. And so we all have the blood on the the outside doorframe, but we don't have his body on the inside of our flesh. And so remember, the blood was slain, put on the doorpost, but then the rest of the lamb was supposed to be eaten. And so Jesus is not to be looked upon, but he's supposed to be fed upon. And so it's just not good enough for you to have him on the doorpost. You should have him in your heart. When you have him in your heart, that's when reset comes. And so the spiritual nourishment and strength comes not from just putting it on the doorpost, but spiritual nourishment and strength comes from eating him. And so if you feed upon Christ, it must be the full Christ, not the part you like. The Bible says, verse 8, and they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. And so Jesus is offering himself to be fed upon, and he says, you know what, you can't pull out the good parts that you like about this. He says, when the reset comes, it's going to come, and you're going to have to have all of me. God wants to get all on the inside of you. And all of those things that are not like him, he wants to wash you. He he wants to purge you with hyssop. And so for the last four weeks or five weeks or six weeks, there has been a resetting going on. And you can feel it in your spirit when you're sitting at home and you're saying, I wonder what else I should be doing. God is calling you because he wants to reset you because he's getting ready ready to release you. And so if you feed upon Christ, you'll never be thirsty again. You'll never be hungry again. And so, but you have to eat all of him. And so the scripture says they were to eat all of the lamb. All of the lamb was to be eaten by all of the people. And so notice this also, that there wasn't a priest that was administering the lamb. The priest of the house was the person who administered the lamb to the family. And so Aaron didn't come to everybody's house. And so they were all sheltering in place. Aaron and his family were at home. And so Moses and his family were at home, just like you and I, my, our families are at home. And so when it came to eating Christ, they all had to get the lamb, and they had to put the blood on the doorpost, and then they had to feed one another. And so Christ is wanting us to feed one another. 
And so Moses told them that they were all going to have to digest the lamb. John chapter 6, verse 53, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Life just doesn't come by you confessing that you're a Christian and putting the blood of Jesus on your proverbial doorpost. Life comes by you eating Christ Jesus, drinking his blood, eating his flesh, taking communion as it were. And so it comes by remembering what he has done. It comes by devouring and nourishing yourself on the scriptures. And so Moses told them to roast it and to eat it all. The Bible says this in Exodus 12 verse 8. It says, and they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs shall they eat it. Verse 9 Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs, and the putrinance thereof. He says everything. I know a lot of Christians who like to pick and choose what part of the Bible they like and what part they want to follow. And so, but when it comes to Christ, especially as we look at it in Exodus chapter 12, they had to eat all of it, even the part that they didn't like, because God knows the part that you don't like, in some cases, is the part that you really need. Verse 10, it says, and ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. It says, and that which remaineth of it until the morning, you shall burn with fire. And so, the verse, verse 9 says, eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water. He said, don't eat it raw. Sometimes raw things carry bacteria that has not been burned out with fire. That's why he said burn it. He said, you've got to burn it. Turn to your neighbor and say, you've got to burn it. And so in today's society, we call that well done. God says, I want you well done. He says, I don't want you cooked on the outside and still raw on the inside. It may be good enough for your steak, but it's not good enough for your God. God is saying, I want you thoroughly cooked from the outside to the inside. And so we want raw things because if we cook some things, we got to wait on it. But how many know God is a patient person? He's a patient God. He's calling you to be a patient person. Don't be afraid to put yourself in God's God's hands and let him work on you. We don't want to wait. That's a problem with a lot of us. And so, but good food takes time. A great relationship with Christ will take time. And so God says, I got you in this thing called shelter in place because I'm working on you. A lot of people have said, when do we get out? I can't wait to get out. But how many know when you're released, God's going to have great things in store for you. The lamb was proportioned according to your family, and it should be shared with your neighbor. The Bible says in verse 3, It says, Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. Every house needs to have Christ. While we are at home sheltering in place, we ought to have Christ in the midst of everything that we're doing. The Bible says this in Exodus chapter 12, verse 4. It says, And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of their souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. So notice this. Verse 4 begins to talk about your neighbors. Christ is to be shared. So the blood is to be shed. It's supposed to be put on the doorpost of your, of your house, of your life. You're supposed to eat of the lamb. And if your neighbor doesn't have one, you're supposed to share it with him. And so notice this. The Bible says this. This is good. I got to get to this. Verse 8, it says, And they shall eat the flesh that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. And so he said that not only are you supposed to eat the lamb, but you're also supposed to eat what he's just calling unleavened bread. And so unleavened bread was bread that was made without yeast. And so the bread did not rise because it didn't have any yeast. And in the New Testament, leaven was compared to sin. In 1 Corinthians 5 verse 6, Paul told the church, your glory in is not good. Know you not that a little leaven leaveneth the lump. And he told them this, purge out therefore the old leaven that it may be a new lump 
as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. And so the Jews during Passover, they were supposed to go in every place in their house finding yeast or leaven, and they were supposed to get it and throw it out. So, so notice the picture here. So they were sheltering in place, waiting on God to deliver them. And while they were there, God said, I've got a lamb for you. You're supposed to kill it, put the blood on the doorpost. You're supposed to feed yourself with the lamb. And then also, I've got unleavened bread for you. And so the unleavened bread was bread that was made without yeast. So it didn't rise. It wasn't, as it were, puffed up. And so God is saying that when I send you back out, I don't want you puffed up. And he said, if it takes getting a new lump, then you have to make a new lump. But you can't have the old leaven in the new lump. And so they were supposed to go inside the house, every crook, every cranny, every crevice, looking for anything that had leaven in it, and they were supposed to toss it. And so they were to eat the lamb and purge the sin. Say that with me. Eat the lamb purge the sin. And so that's a directive that God gave Moses and he gave them that they were supposed to eat the lamb, purge the sin, and God knew that the next day they were going to be delivered. And so, in fact, God had told them to do this, mind you, before they were delivered. He told them to do this before they were set free. God was about to release them into a new world for them. God is wanting to release us into a new world, as it were. He wanted them to be different. God wants us to be different. He didn't want them to be the same. He didn't want them to be like other cultures. God is wanting us to be different. He's not wanting us to be like people that we come in contact with. And so he just didn't want them to have the blood on the outside door, but he wanted them to have the blood on the inside of their heart. And so God is just not a protector of our bodies. He's a protector of our souls. David said that God wanted us to have purity on the inward parts. And so God is still looking for that. He's still expecting that. And that's why the Lord had talked to me about having a spiritual reset. And so God is preparing us. And so no one knows what the future holds. I know, but there's going to be a lot of people that are getting ready to get back into society. And God is putting something on the inside of you that finally Christians will begin to share the gospel. We'll begin to tell people how good our God is. We'll become even more devoted. We'll become even more committed. And so if God hadn't done anything for you this past four to six weeks, the devil is a lie. Because I know God has done some things for everybody the past four weeks, five weeks, and six weeks. And so for some people, he's given jobs. For some people, he's given promotions. For some people, he's kept back plagues. For some people, he's begun to put your family closer. He's begun to get mothers and fathers closer with their children. And so God is still in the blessing business, even when it doesn't look like this is a blessing time. And so God is the one who knows how to reset things. This is the meal that heals. And so when you get home, even this evening, after the broadcast is over, go home, get your family, pray with them, and begin to talk to them about the true Passover lamb. And so the children of Israel had just celebrated Passover. Started at the beginning of this month until maybe the 16th of this month. And they got around the table and they began to share what God had done for them. And so that's a story that needs to be told, not just on an annual basis, but every day. So that now when you enter into society, you'll have that fresh on your mind. And so it's good that you wear the blood jersey, but it's more important that you have the body of Christ on the inside of the blood jersey. And so you cannot leave your house in the same manner that you went in. You've got to change. This is the time for the reset. God is pushing the reset button. He's pushing the reset button on you. He's pushing the reset button on your family. He's pushing the reset button on society, on your neighborhood, your community, your state, your nation. He's pushing the reset button. One of the things that, that, that I respect a great deal is that we have had uh, our governor actually had a prayer service. And so we began to see where other preachers were coming in, talking about the name of Jesus, calling on the name of Jesus. That is a reset. And so we should accept the fact that God is God of all. He's Lord of all. He's King of kings, and he is worthy to be praised. And so one other thing I just want you to quickly understand in Exodus chapter 12 is God is telling them that that we should prepare for the future. 
And so he is sitting, setting the reset button so that we can prepare ourselves for the future. Exodus chapter 12, the Bible says, verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. God said this time of resetting was going to be so remarkable in their life until he said, I'm going to give you a new calendar. Yeah. Think about this. He said, verse 2, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of a new year. So when they came out, not only were they new, but God said, I'm getting ready to give you a new calendar. When you come out, God is getting ready to give you a new start date. For all of the things that he had been asking you to do that you hadn't been able to get done because you were too busy, for, for all of the things that he had been whispering in your ear to do, call someone, text somebody, write your book, whatever it is. He, he, you've always said, God, I just don't have enough time. How many know that when you come out of this, you got to make time for God now? And so God has been too good for us not to make time for him. And so God told the children of Israel that, and this happened even before he gave them any other instructions, that this was going to be a new day for them. And so it was going to change so much because he was getting ready to start everything over. And remember, when he let them out, they left Egypt and went straight into the wilderness on their way to the promised land. And so God says, I'm going to give you a new calendar. Say new calendar. He says, I'm going to change your season. God is the only one that can change a season. And the season was changed after the blood was slain, and they walked out into a new day. The same way that when you come out of your house, if you had your experience with God the way that I believe that you should have and should want to have an experience with God, it'll be a new day for you. And so God is so good until he always sees the end from the beginning. What I love about Exodus chapter 12 is that he begins to talk to them about the new day that they were going to have even before they left even before he freed them. And so when God begins to whisper things in your ear about things that you're going to do and things that are going to happen six months from now, then, then you already know he knows the end from the beginning. I can't wait for June and July and August and September because the body of Christ is coalescing. And so we're, big, we're getting bigger and badder and stronger, as it were. And so for some of us, we've been cooped up. And so God is saying, I'm resetting all of this for your good. And so for the people who have been cooped up and you didn't know Christ, I challenge you to know Christ. For the people who've been cooped up and if coming to church has not crossed your mind during this spiritual reset, I challenge you. Go to church. You're like, you know what? I'm a Catholic. If you're a Catholic, then the priest needs to see you. And you may say, well, I'm a Baptist. If you're a Baptist, then your reverend needs to see you. And so wherever you go, wherever you've come from, I, I, I challenge you to get back to God. Amen. And so you ought to learn how to serve and be served and to disciple and to be discipled. And so Exodus chapter 12, verse 4, the Bible says this, and if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. How many know God has enough for everybody? Yeah. What he has given you is enough to be shared. And so for all the people who thought that they weren't needed, no, God needs you. For all the people who were intimidated to go to church because of what you've done, God already knows about it. For all the people who felt like you didn't have the right kind of clothes to wear, it don't take all of that. You can come just as you are. And so for all the people who thought it would be uncomfortable to attend church where culturally you're the minority, I'm here to tell you that's okay too because God is doing this thing. He's in charge. And so you don't, ha you don't have to engage in cultural social distancing anymore. And so God is calling us to a new level. And so it's sad that we're closer friends through social media than we are in real life, that I can talk to you more through the, through the airwaves than I can just picking you up, picking up the phone and calling you. Something's wrong with that. You shouldn't be closer to people through social media than you should be if they're your neighbor or if they're your family, or if they're your cousin. And so you shouldn't be closer to people through social media than you are with God. Amen. Say it's time. It's time to make 
a difference. It's time to have a spiritual reset. It's time to eat of the lamb. It's time, in some cases, to feed your neighbor. It's time to place the blood on your doorpost. It's time to declare and confess God's word like never before. Perhaps it's time to rejoin church. Perhaps it's time to do something that you've never done before. It's, it's time to cast away all the hurts. It's time to cast away all the unforgiveness. It's time to truly start over. Take advantage of this season that God is trying to hit the reset button in your life. Amen. Amen. In closing, I'm going to say this. God wants you back. We are all going through something, but how many know we're all in this house together? And so pretty soon, God's getting ready to open the door, and he's going to allow us to come out. And he wants to see the reset. He wants to see things that are old now turned into things that are new. He wants to see all the old things pass away. He wants, to have a, wants you to have a new mind, a new philosophy about life. How many know that wherever you go, God is with you? And so I challenge you, just hang on. And so God is finishing up his reboot. Society is getting ready to kick in again. Things will be open that once were closed. And I'm praying that your heart, which once was closed, will now be open. You'll be open to hear from God. You'll be open to do what he's asking you to do and that you will take a higher level spiritually than you had before we had shelter in place. And so a lot of people were talking, uh, talk about Christ and they confess Christ and they put the blood on the doorpost as it were, but I don't know if they're actually eating the lamb. And so the lamb was slaughtered just not to give his blood, but to be eaten. And so God is here. He's on the throne. He's wanting to help you. He wants to reset all things in your life. He wants to make all things new. Amen? So when you come out, I'm just thinking of a song, I'm, I'm Coming Out. And it was a, uh, uh, a song back in the 70s. And so, uh, but the song said, I'm coming out. I want the world to know. And so when you come out, you ought to want to let the world know how good God has been for you. And so when you come out, people should see a difference. Your employer should see a difference. Your pastor should see a difference. Your mama nim should see a difference. Your baby's mama drama should see a difference. And so you will have to, you will be a witness like never before. And so when you come out this time, you're going to walk in the favor of God. You're going to walk in the power of God. You're going to walk in the Holy Spirit, and his presence will be around you like never before because that's part of the reset. When the children of Israel left Egypt, they walked in the power of God like never before. And how many know before, before they were free, they had a dimension that God had worked in their life. But after they were free, God gave them a total new dimension. That's part of the reset. And so before you can have Pentecost, you've got to have a Passover. And the Passover is the time that you come before God, that you cry out your heart to him, that he begins to answer you, he begins to add to you, and he begins to deliver you. And so I want to thank you this morning for joining us. Uh, I pray that the message has been a blessing to you. I want to encourage you that, you know what, God wants to reset some things in your life. He wants to restart some things in your life. And so we love you, and until the next time, God bless you. Hey, we want to thank you for joining our broadcast today. Uh, we pray that the message has been a blessing to you. If you want to sow into our ministry, we have three options for you. Uh, the first is going to our website at www.impactcc.org. You can give online there, or you can also uh, text to give, and the number is 405-266-5020. And the last way, if you have a, a check or money order and you want to mail that to us, it's, you can mail that to uh, Impact Community Church at P.O. Box 121 at Oklahoma City, Oklahoma 73101.